Well, let's turn back uh, to those verses that we read in Isaiah chapter 48. We're looking at verses 12 to 22. And we are concluding the eighth section of Isaiah. And I'm not going to give you all the sections, uh, but this is the eighth of ten sections that I've broken up. And the only one that I know of that's broken Isaiah up into that uh, fashion. Uh, but every different uh, person has a different way of doing it. That is my um, view of the book, that it's br- basically broken down into ten sections. This section runs just three chapters, which is chapters 46 to 48. And it really deals with judgment upon Babylon. And in chapter 46, we have judgment in the religious sense on the idols, the idolatry of Babylon. Then in the civil sense or the political sense on or the social sense in chapter 47, judgment on the nation as a whole. And then in chapter 48, we looked at the first half of the chapter last week, which was knowing God in the furnace of affliction. God was going to prove himself and reveal himself to his people in Babylon, in the affliction of that nation. And now in these 11 verses to conclude, we are going to consider knowing God in deliverance from Babylon. So two aspects of knowing God, knowing God in the affliction, and then knowing God in deliverance from the affliction. We have Four things that we're going to consider from these 11 verses. We're going to consider knowing God as sovereign creator of all things. Knowing God as sovereign judge of Babylon. Knowing God as savior of his people. And then knowing the joy of his salvation. And each of these sections begins with a specific exhortation. Which is progressive in nature. You'll see in verse 12. At the beginning of verse 12 it says... Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. So it's a, an initial call to hear, specifically to the people of Israel. Then in verse 14, it is, All ye assemble yourselves and hear. So it's not just hear, but now it's assemble. It's like the church principle, isn't it? The assembly of the saints. It's not enough just to hear individually. But we must come together to hear the word of God. And then in verse 16, it is come near unto me. So again, we see a progression here that it's not just hearing. It's not just assembling together to hear. Now it's coming near to God to hear his word. And then lastly, in verse 20, it is go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans which, of course, is the uh, pinnacle of their deliverance uh, from that nation. So let us consider those four points. First of all, knowing God as sovereign creator of all things in verses 12 and 13. As we have said already, note who the ones who are to hearken. It is O Jacob and Israel, Jacob being the, the name according to the flesh, And then Israel, the name that God uh, gave to them. One speaking of their humanity uh, apart from God and the other speaking of their uh, place with God in his saving mercy. But then secondly, who is calling them to hear? It is the one who refers to himself as I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. This is the Sovereign, preeminent God is calling them to hear. So it's, it's identifying the two parties, if you like, in this encounter, in this communication. The one who is speaking, the sovereign God, and the one who is to listen, his people. But God describes himself and has described himself twice already in Isaiah. And this is the third time with this language of I am he, I am the first and The last, we have it back in chapter 41 and verse 4, where he says, I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. And then chapter 44, verse 6, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ takes to himself this language 
in the book of Revelation, showing that he is the sovereign preeminent God. But also notice it is the creator of all things that is calling them to hear. It says in verse 13, mine hand also, not that God has a hand, of course he doesn't, in the literal physical sense, but from our perspective, mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. Of course, God spoke these things into existence. God did not do a physical act. He did a work of speaking things into reality. My right hand, the right hand in scripture is the idea of power. Uh, So my right hand, my power hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. I've said to you in the past, or maybe not to use specifically, but to the congregation, I have said that God is the only one who can speak things into existence. He's the only one who can say, be, and it is. And he's the only one who can create ex nihilo, out of nothing, God creates. So the doctrine or the idea or the philosophy or theory of evolution is nonsense. The idea that something can come out of nothing by itself is nonsense. But God can create ex nihilo out of nothing. God can create and has created all things. And this is the one that is calling to them. And again, this is in contrast with all the the idols that they would have seen around them in Babylon. We know from the book of Daniel that there were many idols. And really it didn't matter which idol you worshipped once you gave your final allegiance to the king of Babylon. But this is being said in sharp contrast between the the idols of Babylon and the true God. It's, It's a bit like Paul when he was speaking in Athens in um, or to, the, to the Athenians in, in Acts chapter 17. And he, he contrasts all the gods of that people with the true God. So this is the God who was calling them to hear. But then secondly, not just knowing God as the creator of all, but knowing God as sovereign judge, again, of Babylon. What God is saying here is, I have created all things and therefore, though you are my people in a saving sense, all people belong to me as creator. In fact, Paul uses that language again back in Acts 17 saying that in that in that sort of broader sense, we're all the the offspring of God because he has created us, not in the saving sense, but in the sense as creator. So here now, God in verses 14 and 15 is saying that, uh, he, his people is to know him, not just as creator, but as sovereign judge. And this is where man will not accept. In fact, man will not accept anything about God. Man will not accept that he's creator. They will certainly not accept that he's the judge. As we said this morning, you know, we will not have this man to reign over us. We will not have this God to reign over us. Now the call in verses 14 and 15 is not just to hear, as we said, but to assemble and hear. All are to do this. It is all ye, all the people of God, are to assemble together and hear his word. As Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Notice three things in these verses very briefly. One, they are to hear the one who can speak better than all the wise men of Babylon. Look what it says in verse 14. Which among them, that is, which among uh, the wise men of the Babylonians has declared what I have declared? Isn't it amazing that the world in its rejection of God will elevate fools to the place of wisdom? The Bible says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And yet the world elevates these so-called wise men which are fools in God's sight. In fact, there was a time in history, and not too long ago, when all the, 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 the people of politics and of science and of education were Christians. They mightn't have been uh, all evangelical Christians, but they were professed believers in the God of the Bible. They believed in the Christian God. But now we 
are in a situation where the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people in all the places of power and influence are atheists, either in principle, but certainly in practice. So they, they are to hear the one who can speak better than the wise men of Babylon. But secondly, they are to hear the one that is sovereign over Babylon. Get this. He's not just sovereign, sovereign over Babylon, full stop. He is sovereign over Babylon for the sake of his people. It reminds me of Ephesians where it says that Christ is the head over all things to the church. Look what it says. The Lord hath loved him. This seems to be a reference initially to the king of Persia. But preeminently, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that in Isaiah. In, in order to understand Isaiah, you need to understand that there's, there's twofold fulfillment. You have quite often a reference to the Persian king who is going to come and destroy uh, Babylon and uh, release the people of God. But this is typical, or this represents the greater deliverance and the one who would come to deliver, not from the king of Babylon, but to, but to redeem us from the king of darkness, and that is the devil. So the Lord hath loved him. So typically the king of Persia, but preeminently Christ. He will do his pleasure on Babylon. And again, Babylon doesn't just relate to the historical kingdom of Babylon that existed in the 6th century. Um, but it is representative of all false religion. Because we have it, don't we, going right back to Genesis. Right back to Genesis, we have this Babylonish religion, and it goes all the way to Revelation. So it spans the whole of Scripture. There is this Babylonish religion that Christ is the enemy of and are the enemy of Christ. But Christ will do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be on the Chaldeans. It's, it's, it's really the idea of, of taking hold of them and being their sovereign, being their judge. Again, as we said in Ephesians, he is the head over all things for the sake of his church. And then thirdly, they are all to hear the God that speaks and calls for the deliverer who shall deliver his people. Look at verse 15. I, even I, have spoken, yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Again, typically speaking of Cyrus, but um, in reality, or in the fullest sense, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this uh, later on in Isaiah, uh, where it talks about the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach freedom to the captives, um, Isaiah 61, 60 or 61, I believe it's 61. The Lord Jesus Christ reads those verses where? Luke chapter 4. That's what you're thinking, wasn't it? Luke chapter 4. The Lord Jesus Christ reads those verses and then uh, closes the book, gives it to the attendant or to the minister, as it says in the AV, and says, Today in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. And everybody just sort of sit back and go, Wow. What a thing to state. And again, if any other man had stated such a thing, he would be rightly called a madman. I remember being in uh, Hyde Park at Speaker's Corner in London, and you had all sorts of weirdos uh, speaking. Although some people would think we're the weirdos as we preach the gospel, but there you go. But there was one, there was one man, and he looked very strange physically, but he was boldly proclaiming that he was the Son of God. With no embarrassment, with no shame, I am the Son of God. And he was getting a greater hearing, well, probably because people thought he was funny, uh, than the people who are actually preaching about the real Son of God, which is the sad reality of our day. Uh, but the Lord Jesus is the one who can, not only without embarrassment or shame or being <coughs> in any way humorous, can say truly that he is the fulfillment of all these prophecies. He is the one who is greater than Cyrus. He is the one who is the great deliverer of his people and who reveals himself in judging the enemies of God's people and thereby delivering his people. Our third main heading is knowing God as saviour of his people, verses 16 to 19. And again, the progression, as we said already, the first one was 
hearken unto me, my people. The second one was all assembled together and here. Now it's come ye near unto me. Hear ye this. So not only are we coming together, we are coming to God to hear. Isn't that true of our time now? We're not just coming to hear a man. We're not just coming together. We're coming to hear God. Notice the following in these verses. First of all, this is the God who has spoken openly. He says, I have not spoken it in secret from the beginning. God has not spoken in a corner. The vast majority of people won't even open a Bible. God has given his word. God has given it openly. But people don't want to hear it's not God's fault. It's the fault of sinful man. Secondly, this is the God that sends the Savior from the time that it was. There am I and now the Lord God and his spirit had sent me again. This is reflective of Isaiah 61, which was quoted in uh, Luke chapter 4. He sends the Savior. There's a wrong idea, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a wrong idea that some people have that the, the Father was angry with us and the Son came to deliver us from the anger of the Father. That's not a biblical idea. It is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But thirdly, this is the covenant God that is, as we see in the text, that is thy Redeemer, that is thy Holy One of Israel, that is the Lord thy God and our profitable teacher. This is covenant relationship. This is redeeming, holy, personal, and educational, if I can use that word, uh, relationship with the living God. It's not that God just um, uh, forgives us, but he enters into this covenant relationship this personal relationship to be our Redeemer, our Holy One. And this is the amazing part of, of these words, is that God's character, now get this, God's character and God's identity is declared in the context of his relationship to his people. God is known by who he is in this world as he relates to his people. So in all the way back in Genesis, he's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Now we, we say he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we do not, now get this, we do not have the same God as the Jews. There are many evangelicals who seem to have this false notion that we worship the same God. We don't. Our God is the God and Father, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have the same God as Islam, who says that God has no son. No, God is identified by relational principles. So in Isaiah 48 and verse 17, thus saith the Lord, as we said, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, and so on. Fourthly, the missed blessings for not Heeding his word. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. There's a sadness here, isn't there? In the voice of God. It's like the Lord Jesus Christ again in Luke's gospel, where he looks upon Jerusalem and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that stones the prophets. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. And look at the five things that would have been true. Then had thy peace been as a river. We said this morning, didn't we, that the problems that begin in our lives is when we stop heeding the word of God. When sin enters and when we stop heeding the word of God, then we lose our peace. It says in the last verse, doesn't it, there is no peace saith my God to the wicked. I remember my mother used to say those words, there's no rest for the wicked, is how she used to put it. And I just thought it was a human phrase. And then I read my Bible one day and realized, no, it's, it's here. There is no peace. There is no rest for the wicked. But when we hear the commandments of God, as the Lord Jesus says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. 
but not only peace, but righteousness. Thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Get this, and and, and this is not, um, this is not just justifying righteousness. This is not just the righteousness of Christ. This is sanctifying righteousness. That when we hear the commandments of God and do the commandments of God, we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and we become holy people. One of the great sorrows of my own heart is realizing how far behind where I should be in the Christian life because I have not listened to God's law. I've not listened to his commands. I've not done what he said and therefore I don't have the peace that I could have. I don't have the righteousness the practical godliness that I could have if I listened more to what God has said and done his will. It says also in verse 19, thy seed also had been as the sand and the offspring of thy bells like uh, the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. In other words, your children, which would have been blessed have been cut off because you have not listened to my commands. We have a responsibility not just for our own souls, but for the generations ahead. Fourthly, and lastly, knowing the joy of his salvation, verses 20 to 22. Again, the progression. Hearken to me, verse 12, O Israel. Assemble yourselves together and hear, verse 14. Come near to me, verse 16, and hear. And now it's go ye forth of Babylon. Flee from the Chaldeans. When we hear the word of God and when we come together as the people of God and come near to God, what will result? It will be deliverance. It will be salvation. It will be the reality of God leading us in victory. It is, notice, with a song. It is with the joy of the Lord. It's with a voice of singing, declare ye. But it's also with speech. It is, tell this. So we're to sing of this great deliverance of the Lord. But we are to preach it. But it's a universal scope. It's unto utter, sorry, utter it even to the end of the earth. Now we learn here that in the Old Testament, and again, this is a wrong idea that some people have. Some people think that, well, in the Old Testament, it was all about that little piece of real estate in the Middle East called Palestine or Israel. And it was all about that, and there was nothing in the rest of the world. But here, 700 BC, God says, utter it to the ends of the earth. Preach the word in all the world. It was never just meant to be for Israel. And, and get this. Israel was chosen to be God's light to the Gentiles. That's why God chose Israel. He chose Israel so that they would be the example to the world of what it is to be the people of God. But what happened? They failed. Because they became inward looking and selfish. That's what's happening in much of the church today, isn't it? In much of the church today... It's, let's just huddle together, let's just have our own thing and, you know, have our own salvation and we just won't tell anybody else about it. That's what much of the church is like today. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ came to put right what Israel had put wrong. The message. Look at the message. What is the message? Look at verse 20. And it's not a new translation, by the way. Uh, it is, but it's an awful translation. I wouldn't even call it that. Um, but the message here is, Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. This is beautiful. You see, quite often the Lord Jesus said to people when he done uh, a wonderful work of deliverance for them, he just say simply to them, Go and tell what the Lord has done for you. It's exactly what we have here. The message is the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. The psalmist could say that um, to tell what God has done for my soul. 
He has loosed my bonds. He has, as the, as the poet said, he has set the prisoner free. And you see, so often we fail here because rather than going telling people what God has done for us, which actually is the difficult part, that's difficult. Because that commands reality. It's easy for me to go and tell somebody else what they are to do. What's really difficult is to sit down with somebody and say, can I tell you what God has done for my soul? That God has rescued me. That God has saved me. That God has made me more holy than uh, I was before and is making me more holy by his word. That's difficult because that demands reality. And fifthly, the Lord's ministry to his servants. As we serve him, when we thirst, verse 21, they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. They physically, humanly should thirst, but no, they don't. Why? Because he caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. We live in a wilderness We live in a spiritual wilderness. I mean, if we were just to invite the vast majority of people in this general area in with us now at this moment, we would be to them like some sort of aliens from a different planet, which we really, well, not from a different planet. We are. We are aliens. Uh, We're different because God has delivered us. But this God supplied all the need. He supplied water In the desert, he claved the rock and the waters, know what the text says, gushed out. Not just a trickle, gushed out. The Lord Jesus said, the one, is it Revelation, or sorry, is it John chapter 7, where the Lord Jesus says, the one who believes in me, that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And finally, the reason, or at least from the earthly point of view, the reason of our mission the misery of the wicked. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. That's the reason why we preach the gospel. They have no peace. And they're too proud to admit it. But we must keep preaching Jesus Christ. We must keep bringing the Redeemer, the one who has blessed us, and we must come close to this God, so that we might be effective witnesses. So that we're not just talking about distant experiences in our past, but that we are speaking about what God is doing in my soul today, what God is doing for me now, that I'm experiencing the reality of God in my soul now. As Peter says, always be ready To give an answer for the hope that is within you. We can only be ready when we're close to God. We can only be ready when we're in his word. Hearing his word. Gathering together. Coming near to him. And obeying him. And proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us conclude with Psalm 116 verses... 1 to 8. Psalm 116, verses 1 to 8. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. I, while I live, will call on him who bowed to me his ear. And then the psalmist goes backwards in his experience. He's speaking back in verse 3 of death, the cords, and sorrows did. This is what, what it was like. They compass me around. The pains of hell took a hold of me, I grief and trouble found. Upon the name of God the Lord then did I call and say, Deliver thou my soul, O Lord, I do thee humbly pray. And then he's able to to testify, God merciful and righteous is, because he did answer my prayer. He did set me free. Yea, gracious is our Lord. God saves the meek. I was brought low in the past. He did me help afford. O thou my soul, do thou return. In other words, keep going back to the God of thy salvation, to thy quiet rest, for largely, lo, the Lord to thee his bounty hath expressed. There's reasons. 
because of the blessings of God already received. And then verse 8, From my distressed soul from death, delivered was by thee, thou didst my morning eyes from tears, my feet from falling free. Psalm 116, verses 1 to 8. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. I, while I live, will call on him who bowed to me his ear of death the cords and saw Roasted about me, covers round the pains of hell to call on me. I grieve and trouble found upon the name of God the Lord. Then did say, Deliver thou my soul, O Lord, I do thee humbly pray, God merciful and righteous is, yea, gracious is our Lord, God saves the He did me help afford. O thou, my soul, do thou return unto thy quiet rest. For largely, Lord, the Lord to thee is bound. Hath expressed for my distressed soul from death, delivered was by thee. Thou didst my morning eyes from tears, my feet from falling free. stand for closing prayer. Lord, we we bless the God who has not spoken in secret, but the God who has revealed his word, who has written his word in time and has given it to all who will earnestly seek him. Father, we we pray that as thy servants we would learn of Thee, that we would come close to Thee as we come close together, so that we would not follow the, the, the times of separation, but that we would long for fellowship with Thy people and with Thyself. Lord, Defeat the devil in our lives. Make us holy men and women of the living God. And Lord, we pray that we would become thy people and thy people of the book, the word of God, that we would become earnest students of the scripture, not for academic or intellectual reasons, to learn God, to know God as we considered last week in the furnace of affliction, but then know him in his delivering power. So Lord, bless us and bless thy word to our souls and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with his people. Amen. Thank you.